All right, hello everyone. Thanks for joining over Zoom and I apologize for not being able to teach in person today. Um, I guess everyone can hear me and see the slides, right? Good. If any of you guys have any questions during the lecture, uh, feel free to either post them in the chat or raise your hand or even just unmute yourself. That's all fine. Uh, so let's just start by going through and reviewing a little bit about where we are and what we're doing. So <clears throat> this unit is about feature selection. The motivation is we learned in the last unit that when you have too many features, in your model that leads to a high error variance, which then leads to a high mean squared error. We'd like to use as few features as possible as long as we're not biasing ourselves by leaving out important parts of the true relationship between the features and the data, the features and labels. So essentially we wanna figure out which subset of features is sort of the minimum subset that explains the data but doesn't have any additional capacity to explain noise that's not in the data. And we do this, or we call that, that procedure of selecting the features feature selection. Um, and so the first thing we said is, okay, if you wanna do this in the optimal way, there is a way to do that. It's called exhaustive search. And basically what you do is you consider every possible subset of features. Uh, if you have D total features, that means two to the power D, which is, depending on what D is, if D is large, that's a huge number of subsets. Um, so this, this approach is feasible only when you have relatively few number of features, such as in our demo, I think we have eight features there. So we can actually do this and we can compare to it, but in a lot of practical situations, you simply cannot do exhaustive search. But anyway, um, yeah, the way, the way you do it is you just consider every possible subset of features and then you do K-fold cross-validation and you figure out which of those subsets gives you the, the, you know, the lowest mean squared error for cost validation or RSS. And then we talked about um, three different more practical methods. Uh, the first one, steps, stepwise selection. Um, you can either do forward selection or backwards elimination. And the idea is you, with forward selection is you just add one feature at a time, you figure out what's the single most important feature. Um, let's see, someone said that they can't hear. Um, I think most people said they're able to hear, so. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so with, with uh, forward selection, you basically add, you figure out which is the, the single best feature by doing you know, cross-validation. You add that to the set of features you're gonna keep, then you figure out which is the next best, which is the second feature you're gonna add to your first kept feature. And now you, you have these two features you're gonna keep and so on. You do this until your RSS starts climbing or MSE starts climbing. Um, the other approach is you start with all your features and then you remove one at a time and you keep doing this until your RSS starts going up and so on. So these, these approaches, they're not optimal. They do work pretty well in practice um, and we can compare how they work on the demo. Okay, and we also talked about another uh, class of methods, which is um, even a little bit more heuristic where the idea was motivated by the fact that when we looked at um, simple linear regression, we saw that R squared was nothing more than um, rho, rho xy squared, which means that in that case, it's really all about how correlated the feature is with the target, more correlated is better. And so that kind of leads to the idea, why don't we evaluate each of our features individually, measure their correlation with the target, and then put them in a ranked order. And then, we have basically a model or selection problem. Do I use only the single most correlated feature, the two most correlated features, the three most correlated features, and so on? And we know how to do that model or selection. That's tractable. Um, and then we said that there's another variation on this where instead of using correlation, you use another metric like mutual information or 
F value or P value. And if you don't know what those mean, it's not a big deal. They're just alternatives that you could try and set a correlation. And uh, my experience is that none of these work really well in practice, but they are they are methods to know about. Um, okay, and that moves moves us to feature selection via regularization, which is how we're going to spend um, most of the rest of this unit. Um, and the idea there is that back in unit two, we said to train our parameters beta just by minimizing RSS. And then in unit two, we said the problem is you can't do model order selection by looking at RSS because as your model order increases, your training RSS just gets better and better. So if we want to do model order selection, um, looking at RSS alone is, is not enough, but maybe we can add one other term that is a penalty that this second term, this regularization term, grows as we add more features to our model. And that way, by minimizing the sum of them, we actually can do, we can both train our parameters and do feature selection, you know, perhaps. So, so that's sort of the idea. Another way to think about this is if, if you're asking the question, should I include the J feature or not in my model? You could look at this criteria and you could say, okay, compute this with the J feature and without it. And if this is lower with the J feature in there, then that would be, that, that says, yes, you should include it. And when this is lower, that means that the RSS has decreased more than the penalty has increased. So you've got a net benefit from including that feature. Now, if you're looking at a, a feature that's really not very important, what you'll probably see is that the RSS will not go down much relative to the penalty. That will go up more than the RSS will go down. And as a result, if you ask the question, should you include that unimportant feature or not, this would increase. And therefore, according to this method, you should not include that feature. So that's sort of how this idea works, is you add this penalty, which penalizes how many features you're using in your model, and you combine that with your training RSS. Um, so, so that's where we were. And that led us into thinking about different ways of constructing that penalty. And so we talked about the two most well-known ways to do regularization uh, would be L2 regularization and L1 regularization. So both of them penalize or use a penalty that is the sum of some function of the, the beta parameters, the weights. So L2 uses sum of beta squared and L1 uses sum of absolute value beta. Both of them have an adjustable parameter alpha that overall is going to adjust how strong the penalty is relative to the um, your original training RSS. And we'll see that that can be used to select the number of weights. That sort of will give us a model order selection problem in terms of how to choose alpha. And the first thing we noticed when we compared these different regularizations just graphically, if we looked at one term, you can see that. Um, the L1 penalty is actually stronger for small betas, whereas the L2 penalty, sorry, L2 penalty is stronger for the uh, large betas. So this gives us a little bit of intuition about what might happen. And another important thing is we're never going to penalize the intercept term. So that's not included in these sums. And then one other thing we talked about is we noticed that in forming these particular penalties, we are using the same we're applying the same kind of penalty to all the different beta J weights. So we're just treating all the beta Js as equally important. And there's one kind of catch is in order to do that, we have to make sure that all of our features X have approximately the same size. Because if we had, if we were given a data set where some of our features were orders of magnitude larger than other features, that probably suggests that the betas, some betas will be orders of magnitude larger than others. And, and if that's the case, then those huge betas would be penalized in a very different way than the small betas according to either of these. So really for this to work well, we need to normalize our features so that they have a roughly the same size. 
And one way to think about doing that is to set their average squared values to be a constant like one. <clears throat> then we said there's actually another convenient thing we can do. In addition to this normalization, if we also remove the mean of both our targets and all of our features, then we know from looking at the um, least squares coefficients that that will automatically set our intercept term to zero. And setting the intercept term to zero is kind of convenient because then these beta j's that remain are the ones that go in the sum. We don't really have to worry about treating that intercept term differently than all the other beta j's because you just know it's zero and you don't even bother estimating it. So, and then when you put together this normalization idea and the zero mean idea, we call that standardization. Um, so basically in standardization, the first thing we do is we compute the sample mean of each of our features, J. We subtract that from all of the samples for the Jth feature. And then we divide the result by the standard deviation of the Jth feature. And now we get these new features. And here by this left word arrow, I'm just saying, let's just rename them Xij. So now these new Xij's are guaranteed to be zero sample mean, as well as uh, unit sample standard deviation. And here we're doing the same thing to the uh, to the training labels. Um, and there's a nice way to do this in sklearn using this standard scalar object. And the last thing we said regarding this was make sure that you do you do exactly the same procedure here to your test data. So you use the same x bar and s quantities for training tests which means that for your test data, you're actually using the training statistics, not the test statistics. So that's important. If you don't do that, it doesn't work as well. Okay. Um, and okay, so we're getting kind of close to the end of last lecture. So putting together some of these ideas, if we are gonna be, if, if our training uh, cost is gonna be RSS plus L2 regularization, we can write this in a more compact way that instead of using sums, we use these norms. These are both gonna be Euclidean norms. We have the standard RSS here plus alpha times the squared Euclidean norm of beta. And then if that's, that's what we call ridge regression, that's just the name that's given. And then lasso is the name that's given when you do RSS plus L1 regularization. And here again, this is the same RSS as before. The difference now is instead of the squared Euclidean norm, you have the unsquared L1 norm. And we can think of these norms if we want as just different ways of measuring distance. The L2 norm measures just the straight line distance between points, whereas the L1 norm measures the sum of the coordinate wise distances between two two vectors. And depending on your objective, sometimes one norm is a better norm than another when you're measuring distance. So like we said, if you're driving a taxi cab, maybe actually the L1 norm is the one that matters, not the L2 norm. Okay. So coming to ridge regression, um, let's actually zoom over to this plot. So this plot is very insightful because it tells us what the coefficient values are as a function of alpha. So as if we start with alpha, which is the weighting on our penalty, if we start with a very small alpha, which is way to the left here, you essentially get something that's equivalent to the least square solution. So it's just like minimizing training RSS without any penalty. Then as alpha gets larger and larger, eventually this term is so much larger than this term that when you minimize the sum, you, you really only care about minimizing the second part. And at that point, you just shut all your betas down and asymptotically as alpha goes to infinity, your beta vector goes to zero. So this is not interesting. Least square solution we also know is, is not so interesting. What's interesting is for alphas in the middle, what happens? So overall, what happens with ridge regression is your coefficients shrink towards the origin, but it's not just that they all their sizes shrink at the same rate. 
interesting things happen where you know some of the coefficients that started out like this brown one that started out quite large ends up crossing and changing signs and so on. And so there's there are interesting things that happen in ridge regression. And but the one striking thing that we see from this plot is that it's not really going to help us do feature selection, meaning it's not going to force the betas to zero unless you go to this extreme case where alpha goes to infinity. To do feature selection, we really want to force some subset of our betas to zero, and then that means we're not going to be using those features. So instead, we said ridge regression uh, actually has a different purpose. Um, it's really useful when the when the different features, uh, or in other words, the columns of your feature matrix X, when they are correlated. And what happens in that case is that <clears throat> essentially you can get values of your, um, your least squares coefficients. This is if you didn't do any regularization and you just had very correlated features and you just did the standard least squares solution, you might find that some of these values are incredibly large. And those super large features, they work okay for the training data, but then when you use them with test data, crazy things can happen. And we can recognize that as just an instance of overfitting. Um, and so, and you'll actually see this uh, in the lab for this unit. So in order to prevent that, those crazy large beta values, you add this penalty on their, you know, squared, sum of squared sizes, and that just squeezes them towards the origin in a sensible way and gives you a beta vector that is gonna work much better on your test data than without this penalty. So it's a way of essentially reducing overfitting when you have correlated features. Some data sets have very correlated features, others don't. So whether this is useful or not really depends on your data. But in the lab, you'll see kind of an extreme data set that really requires something like this to work at all. All right. Um, so that's ridge regression. Are there any questions on ridge regression? Everybody good? Okay. All right. And then lasso, let's again look at the coefficient path. So with lasso, we see actually the behavior that we would hope to see. Oh, someone's asking how is ridge regression related to one standard error uh, test or one standard error rule? Um, so you, so I, I, I think it's, it's not directly related, but the one standard error rule is a rule that you can always use as an option when you're doing parameter tuning. So if you wanted to apply ridge regression, the key thing you have to determine is what is your alpha. And so you have to do some sort of, you know, maybe you make a grid over you know, various possibilities for alpha, you could do like cross-validation um, MSC or RSS over that grid. And then you could see which one minimizes your, your mean squared error. And that's that's a simple thing. Or, or you could say something like, well, um, maybe I want to try to use the one standard error rule. Maybe that will work better. And for that, you would have to identify what is what is the simpler model? Because the one standard error rule basically says, what's the simplest model that gives you an equally good explanation as the, like the MSC minimizing model? So actually for ridge regression, it's, it's a little bit hard to say what is a simpler model because all these models have the same number of non-zero coefficients. It's just that their values are shrinking. So. So it's actually kind of a good question whether one standard error rule makes sense for, um, for ridge regression. I would say maybe it doesn't make that much sense. Um, maybe it's not really something to focus on for ridge regression. However, you definitely can use it for lasso and we will see that in just a few slides. So hopefully that explains, that answers that question. Okay, so coming back to lasso, when we look at the, um, the coefficient path, we see the behavior that we would like to see for feature selection, which is when you increase alpha, one by one, the features turn off, they go all the way to zero. So first this brown feature, uh, LCP, first that 
that goes to zero, which essentially means for alpha greater than that number, you're completely ignoring that feature. Then the next one to turn off is this Gleason thing that turns off there. So for all those alphas, that's off and so on. Eventually, if you make alpha too large, then all your features go exactly, or all your, uh, sorry, coefficient values go exactly to zero. And it's, you know, you're not using any features anymore. So it's obviously too much. It's a trivial model. So the interesting, you know, region for, for lasso would be somewhere in here where you've start, you started to turn off some subset of features. Um, so that's, so that's what we see with lasso. It's really doing feature selection, which is, which was our original objective, which is good. However, there's a few complications. So when we look at the optimization problem that we need to solve for training, which is to find the beta that minimizes this expression, it's unfortunately not so easy to do that. It's not something you can do on paper. Um, unlike ridge regression, when you want to solve this, this actually is something you can drive on paper and you get, and the derivation is very similar to what we did back in unit two. You just set the gradient with respect to beta to zero and you solve for beta and you get this expression. So you can't do that with lasso. In fact, this is not even differentiable because of the, the sharpness of the absolute value at the origin. Um, so, however, although it's not something we can drive by hand, it is what's known as a convex optimization problem, which means that there are solvers that can uh, can solve this. And in fact, there's a lot of specialized solvers that have been developed just to solve this problem. And, and they can do it you know, relatively quickly and so on. And so for us, given that we can use sklearn, this is all gonna be programmed for us. It's not a big deal. We can think of this as a problem that we can solve. It's just not a problem we can write down the expression for. Um, let's see, and what else? Uh, yes, and then there's, there's one more super important uh, thing about lasso, which will kind of guide the next few slides in the lecture, which is that in addition to turning off the feature, in other words, setting the a subset of beta is exactly zero, it's actually doing something else which we don't we, we don't like. And that's, um, for example, let's say that you're focusing on this region of alpha is where you have between you know three and one coefficients. So you can see that if in fact, let's say that for some reason, some genie told you that yes, th these are the three coefficients you wanna use, great. Maybe Lasso has found that subset, but the problem is it's telling you that the betas that you should use are these kind of small value betas. Um, whereas you can see those values are much smaller than the least squares betas. And this is something we don't want, Lasso, not only is it telling us which subset of features to use, it's actually squeezing the beta, the beta um, coefficients for those towards the origin, and that can be causing bias, and that can actually ruin the performance. So as a result, the real way we want to use Lasso is not just to um, optimize the Lasso cost to find the betas and just use those betas. Um, we really need to figure out which subset of features Lasso is telling us to use. And then we just essentially like you prune your data to use only those features. And then you solve it with something like least squares, um, standard least squares linear regression. And that least squares linear regression does not have the bias problem. So um, it's gonna give you better performance than if you actually use Lasso, which is biased. So. Um, Okay, good, good point to pause for a moment. Are there questions on Lasso? Here's kind of a summary slide on Lasso and Ridge. So again, Lasso uses an L1 penalty. It tends to produce many exactly zero beta coefficients, which is good because that means it's doing feature selection. On the downside, it has no closed form solution, so you need to solve it numerically. Um, on the other hand, ridge regression has the advantage that you can write the solution in closed form. And actually, when you when you solve it, of course, you're going to use a numerical solver too. And it turns out that this is a faster problem to solve numerically than lasso. So that's one advantage to ridge. 
but it's not really going to do feature selection because it's not going to set your betas to zero. What it's going to do is it's going to shrink your betas in a way that is helpful with correlated features. Okay, so they, they really do solve different purposes. Both of them are useful. And in fact, sometimes you want to use both of them together. Maybe you use Lasso to figure out which subset of features to use. And then on those, you use ridge regression to deal with their correlation. Um, so, and when you use, as, so there's there are several options there. Um, and I think in the lab, I believe in the lab or the demo, I can't remember, um, goes through some of those ideas. Okay, so that brings us to where we were, kind of a long review of last time, but I think there's a lot of important concepts. And um, so now let's get into some of the details about how we actually do this. And there's a, there's a lot of little, very important things um, to pay attention to here. So, so the first thing is, okay, how do you do Lasso with sklearn? Well, it turns out that there's, it's very much the same way that you do um, linear regression. So you use linear model, but instead of um, linear regression, you do linear model dot lasso. Okay, so it's as simple as that. And then you have the fit method, like always, and the predict method, like always. So that's exactly the same way you use linear regression. So now, the rest of what's going on here is this double for loop approach, which is doing cross validation. And this, with the exception of using lasso here, is identical to what we saw in the last unit when we talked about doing cross validation manually with a for loop. Whereas there we used linear regression, here we're using lasso, but otherwise the code is identical. So again, let's just go over it. Um, the first thing we do is we come up with this. Uh, k-fold object, which is going to be really useful for doing our uh, our k-fold cross-validation, because what it's going to do is it's going to chop up, it's going to it's going to figure out the index sets um, during each iteration of k-fold cross-validation that we're going to use for training and test. And those index sets are shuffled; they're constantly changing. So it's nice to have this method be able to just produce uh, index sets for us. So in the outer loop. We, we go over the number of folds in our, you know, if we have capital K folds, this is, we're gonna go through this outer loop capital K times. And in our inner loop, we go through all our different model hypotheses. So when we did model order selection, we basically had um, D hypotheses because we had D features. Now, instead of, you know, D things, we actually have to build a grid of alphas. So this is just a uniformly spaced grid. And actually, it's not uniform. It's, it's uniformly spaced in the log domain. It's important to use the log domain because um, the alphas you want typically span many orders of magnitude. So if you use linear domain, it wouldn't work well at all. So you have to use log domain. And here we're going from 10 to the power minus 3 to 10 to the power 1. Um, and and we also have to tell it how many values to use in that grid. We're going to use 100 values in that grid. And so this inner loop is going to iterate through those 100 different possibilities of alpha that we set up with this grid. So for each of those alphas, we basically extract alpha, the value of alpha into the A variable. We tell the lasso object to, to set its alpha weight at A. And then we do our fitting. And then we predict on the test features to get our prediction of the test labels. And finally, here we're doing um, mean squared error. We're just evaluating mean squared error for this particular combination of um, the index on the alphas and the index on the folds. So in other words, we are building up this matrix of RSS values for all folds indexed by K and all the different possibilities of alpha that we're testing. Okay, so that's that's essentially what this double for loop does. Any questions on that? Our 10 mount, okay, question is, are 10 to the minus three and 10 to the one common limits for possible alpha values? Not necessarily. Um, what you wanna do is you wanna take a guess. You probably wanna do it logarithmically space, but then take a guess at the endpoints 
then do cross validation and make sure that if you're looking for something to be minimized, make sure that there is a minimum between your endpoints. If you see like that you have, if you see that you have a graph like this that is just going down, and you're looking for the minimum of that, and it and it occurs at an endpoint, that probably means you didn't go far enough in that direction. So you want to you want to increase your limit until you actually see that this that the thing you're trying to minimize is really bottoming out between your endpoints. So, but it really depends on the data, what exactly those values are. So probably have to just do it a couple of times. What does warm start equals true mean? So when you run this optimization algorithm that, um, <clears throat> that minimizes this, warm start means can or should you initialize the beta value for, this is an iterative algorithm that starts with a guess of beta and tries to improve it. So it says, should you be using the last beta you found as the initialization the next time you run the algorithm? That's just going to speed things up. The reason we're doing that here is because when I change my alpha just a little bit over my grid, probably the coefficient values haven't actually changed that much. So I should just start at the old ones and do a little bit of extra optimization to find the new ones. So that's just going to speed everything up to do that warm starting. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions so far? Okay. Um, okay. So then finally, once we build out this matrix of RSS values, just like before, we're going to average over the different K folds, and you're going to get an RSS bar. Those are like the average values of RSS for each tested value of alpha. And you're also going to get a standard error on alpha. Now, um, the way that we're doing that, as you can see, we're taking the standard deviation, uh, the sample Y standard deviation from this matrix, and then we're using the DDOF equals one, which is going to be the unbiased standard deviation, and we're dividing it by the square root of the number of folds. So that's how we compute standard error. And once we have both of those, we can use them together for the one standard error rule, um, or just even plotting these gives us a, an indication of how much to trust our RSS bar values. So the question, can you explain how to get from MSE to RSS? Yeah, MSE is just um, RSS divided by the number of samples. So that's so just divide by N samples in your data set. <clears throat> we, we often use them interchangeably because they mean the same thing. They're just scaled in a slightly different way. Um, okay, so, all right, so that's, that's how we finally compute these key quantities, which we can use for model order selection or, yeah, because essentially now that we are just choosing, uh, a value of alpha, we are essentially doing model order selection where, as you can see, when alpha is small, we have a complex model with a lot of coefficients. And as alpha gets larger, our model gets simpler. And it, because we keep turning coefficients off. So this is really, we're sort of trying to solve a model or selection problem here. <clears throat> okay, now, turns out, not surprisingly, that all the stuff in this giant for loop is very common to do when training models. And so scikit-learn basically said, you know, let's just come up with a couple lines that do all of this so you don't have to code this yourself. And let me zoom in here. That is grid search CV. So grid search CV is a super useful um, tool. And it, it basically does that, that whole procedure. So this is what you have to specify for grid search CV. First of all, you have to specify what estimator do you want to run? So since we're using lasso, let me make a little line. Since we're using lasso here, we're going to tell grid search CV to use lasso. Um, you also, with grid search CV, you're looking over this grid of possible parameter values, in this case, alpha values. So you have to give it that parameter grid. In this case, um, the parameter grid, as you can see, is the vector of alphas. And the vector of alphas was actually something that we initialized earlier in the code to be this. So here we're telling 
grid search to be not only what specific values of alpha to use, but we're telling it that it's the quote alpha um, parameter of the lasso method. So it knows to for the lasso method to vary its alpha parameter according to those values. Okay. The next thing, grid search CV, you know, based on the CV, it needs to know what kind of cross validation do you want to do. So here you're saying set CV equals KF. So KF, that is this K fold object that we built earlier. So once you build that object, you just give that directly to uh, grid search CV. Um, you can also tell grid search CV just to use, if you set CV equals 10, it will do tenfold cross validation, but it will not be shuffled. So in order to get shuffled data, you have to make your own K fold objects with shuffle equals true. So that's why we're making the object and feeding it into here. The last thing you have to tell grid search CV is when doing the grid search, what do you want to minimize? What is your metric? What's your objective? And that's where you tell it the scoring equals negative mean squared error. And that's basically consistent with what we're doing in that loop there. We're using mean squared error is, is the thing we're, we're computing over our grid. So, um, and basically if you run this code here, and if you run grid search CV, you will see that they give you exactly the same answers. And I think the demo shows that. So it's really just purely a coding shortcut for all of this, super convenient. So once you set up your grid search CV object to actually run all that grid search and you just do grid search CV dot fit and you give it your training data. Um, and when it's done fitting, I mean, this could take a while depending on how many points in your grid search and all that. But once it's done, and if you want to know like what is the best test score you found, you can do CV results under bar and then you tell it mean test score. And it will actually, this will give you a vector of values over the different alphas in your grid. <clears throat> so this is like what we want to plot in the end for, if we want to do model or selection, we want to make this plot of basically like RSS bar or MSC bar versus alpha, that's going to be from here. And we also said we want to compute the standard error. Well, we can do that. So we have the we have it report to us the standard deviation, um, not only the mean, but the standard deviation vector. And then we're going to divide it by the number of folds, and that's going to give us the standard error. <clears throat> okay, so these are the two quantities that essentially we were computing here: the uh, the, the mean and the standard error. Now there is one little catch you might notice. Note division by n fold minus one. So this is because when grid search CV computes the standard deviation, it does not have an easy way to use the unbiased standard deviation. So it's going to use the biased version. Well, it turns out that it's easy to make up for that bias by instead of doing square root dividing by the square root number of folds here, you divide by the square root number of folds minus one. So it's just a manner of you're you're essentially getting the same quantity. It's just in in this case, the one over square root n folds minus one is within the standard deviation, not here. Whereas down here, it's within this part, not this part. So they will give you exactly the same value. Okay, so um, someone was asking why why do we use negative mean squared error for grid search CV? It's because um, <clears throat> All of uh, scikit-learn's scoring methods want to come up with a score where higher score is better. And so when we think about mean squared error, that's actually something where lo you know, lower mean squared error is better. So to make mean squared error consistent with other scores, you put a minus sign in it. And then this is going to be a, you know, a non-positive quantity where the larger it is, is the closer it is to zero, which means the better it is. So that's why there's a negative. It's just for compatibility with all of the other scores considered in SKLearn. And there's a huge list of different scores it can handle. <clears throat>
uh, with grid search CV and in general. <clears throat> okay. Um, great. Any other questions on on this page? So there's a lot of information, but it's all super useful and stuff you will use a lot throughout the term. So you'll be using grid search CV quite a bit to replace code like this. Um, and it's important to understand all these different inputs. Okay, everybody good with this? All right, so now let's get into some kind of interesting things. Um, so we computed this RSS bar alpha. So this is, let's see, do I have a picture of this? I don't have a good picture of it, but um, you know, it's, it's gonna be something like maybe something like this. So we have alpha going this direction. We have uh, RSS bar vertically. And so the, so notice what I'm describing on this slide is, is what I'm calling a naive method. I'll explain why that is in a moment. But traditionally what we would think of doing at this point is we say, okay, I have computed RSS bar for all these different possibilities of alpha. So now the way that I run cross-validation or model or selection is I'm just gonna figure out what is the alpha that minimizes this. And that's gonna be the alpha I choose, right? <clears throat> so that's, that's what you would traditionally do. Um, and we said there's actually a few more steps. Once you figure out, maybe I'll, maybe I'll uh, make a little line here. So we'll call this, um, alpha min. And once you figure out your alpha min, um, you could do the following. You could say, okay, I, okay, first of all, in order to come up with this alpha min, I've been running KFOL cross validation. And KFOL cross validation basically means I'm not using my full data set. And so we said there's always a way to improve that. Once you're done with your model or selection, picking alpha, go back and use your whole data set. So we could do this. We could go back and we could compute the lasso coefficients on the full training data using, using this alpha min. <clears throat> and so in the demo, when I ran this, at least with you know the, the seed of uh, that gave the particular shuffle and, and the k-fold split and all that. It turned out that Lasso selected seven of the eight features for prediction, which is which is a lot, right? It's it's not doing much feature selection, but anyway, that's what happened. And so now we said that the last thing we want to do, because of the bias in Lasso, is we want to basically isolate those features. So just throw out the feature that Lasso didn't choose, and now there's seven features left, and then just compute the least squares base linear regression on those features. So we're doing the right thing in terms of using uh, beta, sorry, using lasso only for feature selection because we know that the non-zeros in the lasso are shrunk towards the origin. That's going to cause bias. And by using least squares linear regression, we're not going to have that bias. So, um, so I think all this stuff is, is in this code. I think it's probably pretty, pretty straightforward. It's like we're you get the alpha min, you, you give that to your lasso object, you fit lasso now on your entire data sets. Um, here I'm printing out the actual values of the lasso coefficients and you can see that the intercept is zero. That makes sense because we normalized our data. Um, and we might've even told lasso, I'm trying to remember if we told lasso not to use intercepts. Um, or, or no, actually, let's see. Well, somehow the lasso intercept was zero, maybe not surprising, um, but there's only one other uh, beta value that's zero value. And so that's, that's the one that was thrown out giving us seven. And then, um, oh, and, and then this is how we can extract the subset of coefficients. So the first thing we can do, we take the lasso dot coefficient vector. That's, that's how you export the betas from the model. That's what we use to make this printout look at the absolute values of those, and then figure out which of those absolute values are strictly greater than zero. So that's gonna be a logical vector. 
for these features, it's going to be a logical vector that's, you know, one, 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 one. It's going to be zero for that guy and one, one. And then this numpy where command basically turns this logical vector into a list of numbers. That's going to give you a subset of coefficients that's going to be, it's going to be like coefficient zero, one, two, three, but it's going to leave out this guy. So it's it's going to give you the coefficient indices, but not with not the one that you're throwing out. Once you have that subset, it's easy to prune your features by taking your X trans your X training matrix, looking at all the rows, but then only the columns whose indices are in this subset of coefficients. So this is how we're doing that isolation of features. And now you can see we're just going to use linear regression to fit it. Um, but actually here we're using another new and super useful command called cross fail score. So in cross fail score, you're saying, I just wanted, I want you to run cross validation, not grid search cross validation, just run cross validation. You're telling it which predictor to use, linear regression. You're telling it what is your training data. So those are your training data we're using here. You're telling it which uh, cross cross validation object. So here we're happening to use this recursive k-fold instead of k-fold, but we could have used the same k-fold object from before. And finally, what's the scoring method? One once you run this command, it's going to give you um, the scores over the different cross validation folds. And now we can just take the mean of those. Actually, these are negative mean squared error scores. So we take the mean across the folds, we negate it to get positive mean squared error scores. And this is finally the mean squared error of cross validation of lasso followed by these squares. That's, that's what we mean by lasso under bar LS. So again, a lot of information here, but um, but this is you know going through all the steps that we outlined in terms of using lasso for feature selection isolating those features in this case by just looking at the coefficients that were non-zero and then using those to fit these squares. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, the final result, the mean squared error is actually improved from, uh, I think things we tried before here. Um, oh, actually, yeah, so, so this is the point. If you do lasso alone without using least squares, the mean squared error is higher than if you do lasso followed by least squares. Things got better, which is what we would hope because these are bias coefficients, whereas the ones computed by least squares are unbiased. Okay, so there's a lot of info here. Good time to pause and see if there's any questions on anything. So please repeat what is meant by non-zeros and beta lasso are biased. Yes. So when we look at this um, curve here, we see that lasso is doing two things as you increase alpha. First thing it's doing is it's actually setting some subset of coefficients exactly to zero. The second thing it's doing is on the non-zero coefficients, it is squeezing them towards the origin. We like the fact that it's setting a subset to zero because that's doing feature selection, but this squeezing them towards the origin, making their values really small is not good. That's actually going to reduce your performance because it's basically one way to think about it is you're asking it not only to minimize least squares in your training data, but you're also saying, make sure that the beta values are small in absolute value. Um, and that's that's kind of detracting from, from this. Like if, if you're done with model or selection and you said, I, great, I found my three features that I want to use, then you should you don't want to be penalized by also making the absolute values of those good features small. So this is causing problems. It is shrinking the lasso betas to zero, and we don't want to do that. We want to have lasso tell us use exactly those three features, but then we're going to use least squares um, to actually find the beta values. <clears throat> okay. All right, so any other questions on what we've done so far? So there's sort of, it's 
a little bit hard to see, but there actually is kind of a problem with all of this. And this is why I'm saying it's a naive method. This is actually not what you want to do. I don't know if anybody can see what the issue is. The issue is with the value of alpha that we selected from this procedure. If you think closely, the value of alpha that we selected from this procedure was computed based on these RSS bar values that were in turn, they were computed based on the lasso coefficients, not the least squares coefficients. So it was these, these bias lasso coefficients that determine RSS bar, and that is what we use to choose alpha. So that is actually, again, not what we want to do. We would like to choose alpha based on how good the least squares coefficients that we finally design are. So here's a different method. There's actually two different ways to do that. Uh, let's consider the first way. Um, and so now one way to think about what we're doing is we're not just optimizing lasso. We're optimizing lasso plus least squares as like a two-step process. Um, lasso is just the first half of it that's going to tell us which features to use. Least squares is the second half that's going to tell us what the beta values are for those features. Okay, so that's what we want to do. Here's one way of doing it in pretty simple for loop. So what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we're making a grid of alphas uh, like before. Now, I can't remember exactly why, but I'm using slightly different endpoints on the grid, maybe just to make the plots a little nicer, minus two and point, minus point two three. So I have my grid of alphas. And now I'm going to go over the different alphas on my grid. And for each of those alphas, I'm going 